Um, so yeah, so I'm Kim Stoner. I work at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. I am based in New Haven at, at um, and um, so, uh, and I'm in the entomology department. Let's see, that didn't work. Let's try this. Uh-oh, there we go. Um, so uh, I uh, have been recently uh, having a land acknowledgement at the start of my talks. Um, so I acknowledge that I'm on the traditional land of the Quinnipiac, Pagusset, and Wappinger peoples. Um, where you meet in Canton, I looked at a map, and, um, and according to that map, it's in the area shared by the Wangunk, Sikog, Tunxis, and Wappinger peoples. Um, and then there are other people peoples in, in Connecticut historically and currently. Um, and uh, as we discuss the native plants, insects, and other wildlife, we acknowledge that the native people have lived in this community with these creatures in this place for approximately 12,500 years. And one reason why I started doing the land acknowledgements is because I was reading about the archaeological dig um, along the Farmington River and uh, that found that people had been here 12,500 years very shortly after the glaciers receded. And we know that the native peoples managed land. They didn't manage land the same way Europeans do. They did plant crops, you know, the famous corn, squash, and bean crops, but they also managed land for wildlife um, and for plants that were useful to them in different ways. And um, so, so, you know, that's a long enough time uh, since the glaciers receded for these plants and insects to have evolved with these people. And I think that that's an important thing that we don't often um, mention when we talk about native plants and insects. You may have heard that um, there have been some pretty major um, losses of insects in general. And so this is from uh, a recent paper by Dr. David Wagner, who is a professor at UConn about, and a number of other people as well, about um, some of the threats to insects on a global scale. And so several of these are related to climate change, um, including, of course, global warming, droughts, storm intensity, fires, um, the, the potential for disruption of interactions between insects and their plants. And we'll talk about some bees that are specialists on particular species or groups, I, actually more often genera of plants. And if the bloom of the plants doesn't coincide with when the insects come out, then that would interrupt that um, interaction. Um, and then nitrification, which is something that not a lot of people think about, but our use of nitrogen fertilizer and also burning fossil fuels adds to the amount of, of nitrogen there is in circulating in the soil and water of the planet. And that affects the ecology of lots of different organisms. And then uh, pollution, of course, urbanization. Um, and part of urbanization is also light at night, which affects a lot of insects um, and introduced species agricultural intensification, insecticides, I'll talk a good bit about insecticides, and deforestation. Um, so bees have a, a, a somewhat complicated relationship to forests, which I will talk about also in the course of this. So I just wanted to put the bees in that general context because um, they, they, um, they are part of all of this and we will talk about some groups of bees that are declining. So a review of pollination, um, for those of you who don't remember it from school, perhaps. So um, in 
Uh, pollination is the process of moving pollen from one flower, uh, from the anthers of one flower to the stigma of another flower. Um, there are uh, various methods of pollination. There are plants that are wind pollinated. There are plants that can be self pollinated, but there are also a number of plants that will not set fruit or set seed unless they are pollinated by a, a different plant that has a different genetic background. And um, so that is a big reason why many of our crop plants, our fruit trees, nut trees, some of the fruiting vegetable crops need to have or, or benefit from insect pollination. And also it's important for just like the whole range of plants that um, need to set seed. So, um, and so like 87% of all the plant species are pollinated by some kind of animal. Um, bees are, are very prominent and also flies. A lot of people don't think of flies as pollinators, but also wasps, beetles, lots of other kinds of insects, bats, birds. And so, um, Nearly all fruits, nuts, and fruiting vegetables, and I'll talk some about squash and pumpkins, as um, Sarah mentioned, I've done research on them. But other things like tomatoes and eggplants and peppers either require or benefit from insect pollinators. And then, of course, insects are an important part of the food chain. So um, this is about how we tend to think about insects. So um, uh, the, um, as I've mentioned, flies are important pollinators as well as bees, um, but we don't typically think of flies that I don't think you can probably find pollination in that word, word salad of things about flies that's on the, down in the lower left-hand corner. Um, <clears throat> and, um, so we tend, I think, for each of these groups to think about a small subset of the group that interacts a lot with us and put all the character, characteristics of that subset on the entire group. So flies are a huge and diverse group of organisms, but what we mostly think about are houseflies, and we think of them as annoying <laughs> and um, dirty and all that kind of thing. Um, wasps are a tremendously diverse group. So wasps are in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and as I will talk about in a minute, very few species of wasps in this entire very diverse group sting, but that's like our first association with wasps is that they sting us. Um, bees are of course in the upper right-hand corner. And I will talk about a huge diversity of bees. Um, only honeybees actually produce honey in the amounts that we could harvest. Bumblebees produce teeny tiny amounts of honey. And there are some stingless bees in the tropics that produce honey as well. But that's what we think of as uh, when we think of bees. Uh, we do think of some other things like pollination and stinging and flowers. But um, uh, that you know we tend to associate one one group with the whole thing. Then butterflies, um, people love butterflies, um, and uh, and in that case there are quite a lot of diverse butterflies. But mostly people think about monarchs and not, don't think that much about the other butterflies. So dealing with the myths and the fears. So. Um, most stings are not from bees. They are from yellow jackets, which is a, a social group of wasps. Um, and some of the yellow jackets are native here, like the Eastern yellow jacket, but several of the other ones are, um, have been uh, accidentally brought into this country from other parts of the world. And so it's really the social bees and wasps that are more likely to sting. So yellow jackets are a group of social wasps and they are more likely to sting because 
They create large nests that they then have to defend. Um, and they have castes. They have a large number of workers that are divided up into different jobs. So they have some individuals in their social um, group, their, their society, that are designated to defend the nest. Okay. Um, and the reproductive uh, uh, queen of both the social wasps and the social bees generally is not involved in defending the nest. So she is protected from um, any kind of threat. The solitary and bees and wasps, which are um, bees and wasps where each individual female makes her own nest, they generally don't sting. And for both bees and wasps, the vast majority of species are solitary. So they, you know, I occasionally, very occasionally, an entomologist swinging a net will get stung by these. Um, but uh, there, the, many of the solitary bees don't even have venom. Um, some of the solitary bees and wasps nest in aggregations, and I'll show you some pictures of that too. This doesn't make them more likely to sting. And in all of the Hymenoptera, the bees, wasps, and ants, um, a stinger is a modified ovipositor, so only the female bees and wasps can sting. So honeybees, you know, they are, of course, the most familiar. Um, they are important pollinators of crop plants, particularly for crops grown on large acreages because we can move them. So um, uh, just a few weeks ago, at the end of February and the beginning of March, um, on the order of 2 million honeybee hives uh, were moved to pollinate almonds in California. Um, they, people move tractor trailer loads full of honeybee hives from all over the country um, in order to carry out this pollination and get paid for it. They get paid quite well. Um, the almond growers rent the honeybees, um, but they, ha they, they have to do that because the almonds bloom for a short time and they are grown on such an extensive acreage that um, there's just no way that the local populations of bees could pollinate all of those almond trees adequately for us to have almonds. So, um, and then honeybees, as I note, are not native to North America. Um, so uh, they are important, but they are not, um, they're not part of our native ecology. The beekeepers do lose a lot of bees. People always wanna know how honeybees are doing. Um, and so it's difficult being a beekeeper, particularly, you know, if you're a commercial beekeeper where your livelihood depends on your ability to keep large numbers of hives of bees. Um, you can see in this graph um, that uh, pretty much on the order of about 40% of colonies are lost every year, which is a lot um, to have to replace every year. But it's also true that honeybees are not declining in the way that most people think. We are not on a path to like have honeybees go extinct. I get, you know, things in my Facebook feed all the time saying, we must save the honeybees. They're gonna go extinct and we will all die. And that's not really true. Um, this is an old graph, but I follow every year the National Agricultural Statistics Survey service estimate of how many honeybee colonies there are. So you see at the bottom that um, as of last April, we had just about 3 million honeybee colonies. So since like the mid 1990s, the number of honeybee colonies has remained pretty steady. It fluctuates between about two and a half million and 3 million colonies every year. So even though the beekeepers have these huge losses, they, they continue to make them up. Um, there also continue to be a lot more people interested in keeping bees. Um, and so they have to invest quite a bit in 
continuing to replace the colonies that they lose, but we are not in any danger of losing honeybees altogether. And the biggest problem that they have is this, this honeybee pandemic. So these mites, varroa mites, um, spread all over the world um, in the 1970s, 1980s. They got here in about 1987. Um, and they are devastating themselves to the honeybees and they also carry viruses, um, particularly one virus that's called the deformed wing virus, which has been really um, devastating to honeybees. So honeybees have pandemics as well. And um, that is the biggest problem. There are other problems. They are also suffering from many of the other uh, threats that we saw in an earlier slide. Um, and I'll talk some about pesticides in relation to honeybees, but this is really, you know, the number one issue for beekeepers. So honeybees are different from all the native bees. Um, as I mentioned, they are not native here. They evolved, the group evolved in Asia, the genus of Apis involved, evolved in Asia. Um, they have lived in Europe for a very long time, 300,000 years. There are various races of honeybees that have evolved in different parts of Europe. And they were brought to the US by European settlers pretty much as soon as Europeans got here. Um, there are records from like 1622 about honey, uh, honeybees being brought over from Europe. They live in these giant social colonies with tens of thousands of workers. They do not go dormant over the winter, which is very unusual for any kind of insect really um, here. So they overwinter as a tight cluster of workers and queen, and they are essentially burning honey in their metabolism to keep the temperature up inside the hive through the entire winter. And in February, when the queen starts to lay eggs, they raise the temperature up even higher, up, up, up around close to body temperature for us, um, so that their, the, their brood develops more quickly. So that's one reason why they need to store large amounts of honey. Um, they do that all over the world. Um, in some places, it's to get through the dry season when there's nothing blooming, but here it's obviously to get through the winter when there's nothing blooming. And so beekeepers need to measure um, how many pounds of honey their bees have, and they can only extract um, the excess over what the bees need to have in order to maintain themselves through the winter. They reproduce as a colony by swarming. So um, the, the, when a swarm happens, the old queen and um, a coterie of workers that can be like 10,000 workers go as a swarm and they find a new place to colonize. And the, before that happens, the workers have raised a new queen and the new queen stays in the, in the colony. And then they have, as you may know, this interesting system of communication where scout bees can go out and find sources of food and they come back and they communicate to the other workers. They do this waggle dance on the hive to communicate to um, other foragers where they can go to find abundant food, which is also a very interesting and very unusual uh, behavior. But um, I'm gonna talk about the whole range of bees. So there are more to bees than just honeybees. And so um, this is a, a, a bumblebee on the left and then two different sweat bees in the other pictures, a green sweat bee and another sweat bee. So um, as I mentioned, uh, the bees are really important pollinators of crop plants and a diversity of bees are involved in, in crop pollination. This comes from Virginia, and this is a study that was done over one growing season. 
um, uh, you can see that the honeybee uh, part of sort of slice of the pie is the light blue part. Um, bumblebees are dark blue. And then um, she just had really sort of general categories. We're going to talk more about more of the specific categories later. But so like medium bees are yellow, carpenter bees are orange, small bees, so like those sweat bees we saw in the last picture are green. So um, apples bloom quite early. They don't get a lot of bumblebees. They are often pollinated by honeybees um, and apple growers often rent honeybees to pollinate apples, but they're also pollinated by a large number of other solitary bees, these medium-sized bees, some of the uh, small sweat bees. Um, and then as we go through the season, uh, there are more bumblebees because bumblebees in, the, uh, well, I'll talk about their life cycle, but early in the spring, um, there are only queen bumblebees. It's not until later in the season that they have whole colonies. And so as the colonies develop, bumblebees become more important. But you can see that for all of these, and cane berries, by the way, are like raspberries and blackberries. You can see that for all of these, the honeybees are really only a third or less of the, of the bees pollinating, visiting these different crop plants. So, um, so all of these other bees are important for crops um, as well as for our native plants. So the diversity in Connecticut, uh, we are working, um, as Sarah mentioned, I think, on a checklist of all the bees of Connecticut. Um, and it's really my technician, Tracy Zarillo, who is the native bee identification expert. Um, so far, we have about 370 species. Um, there are still about 15 more that she's still working on, tracking down the specimens, clarifying confusions about identification. Um, but so at least 370 species. Um, we have 40, 41 genera, which is the next classification up from species. As I mentioned, we have one species of honeybee that's exotic and social. We historically had 16 species of bumblebees. We have actually lost some of our species of bumblebees, and I'll talk some more about that, and I'll talk about their life cycles. 12 species of Calides, and I'll show you some pictures of those, and those are solitary bees um, and um, ground nesting solitary bees, 19 species of osmia. You may have heard of them. Uh, they're called mason bees, and they are solitary bees, and people um, create um, uh, nesting situations for some of those solitary, those osmia mason bees, so I'll talk some about that. 83 species of andrina, which are ground nesting uh, solitary bees. People call them digger bees or minor bees. And about 76 species of sweat bees. Um, most solitary, but some social and some parasitic. So I'm going to talk some about bees that are parasitic on other species of bees. Um, and um, most of the, there are a lot of other species that are mostly solitary. So bumblebees, as I mentioned, we historically had 16 species of bumblebees. Some of these have declined and are probably no longer exist in the state. Uh, Bombus affinis, which is also known as the rusty patched bumblebee, is a federally listed endangered species and it still exists in pockets in the Midwest and some in the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia and Virginia, but seems to be um, er, uh, extirpated, that's the word, extirpated from Connecticut and all of New England um, for quite a long time. Um, Bombus ashtoni uh, is a species that, that was parasitic on Bombus affinis and is probably also extirpated from the state. 
The other state listed species is Bombus terricola, um, which declined very uh, seriously um, about uh, seven or eight years ago, but seems to have made a comeback. So we have been able to find Bombus terricola in uh, the Litchfield Hills. Some of these species were always rare in Connecticut. Um, Bombus oricomus and Bombus borealis. We just recently found specimens from 2010. Before that, there was it was only known from one specimen from 1932. Um, but there are some species that are not state listed that we have not seen for a long time, like Bombus pennsylvanicus. Um, and um, so there are some, and also Bombus citrinus, which in the, this paper that we got, uh, that where this graph came from, this table came from, was considered to be increasing in the Northeast, but our last specimen of it was found in 2010. So there are some species that may be declining that we still need to find out for sure if, if they're still around. So as I mentioned, honeybees have a very unusual life cycle in that they're active through the whole winter. Bumblebees, um, it's just the mated queen who hibernates through the winter. So um, the mated queens are now probably still are in their hibernation uh, zones. They're little uh, pockets in the ground that they find to hibernate in. Um, and uh, so they will be coming out soon. Um, and the first thing that they do is feed. They need to, to build back up their reserves of um, protein and carbohydrates because they've been living off their fat bodies through the entire winter while they're, while they're hibernating. Um, and then they have to find a place to nest. Um, bumblebees often nest in abandoned holes of other animals like chipmunks or mice. Some of them nest in birds' nests. Um, some of them nest in like thick bunch grasses. Um, so she finds a place to nest and then she's like a single mom. So she has to go out forage for her nectar and pollen. Um, build the nest so she makes a wax layer to sort of waterproof the nest. She makes um, a little honey pot, that's what you see in front of the uh, queen making her nest, so that she can store enough honey to sort of get her through 24 hours of bad weather, but that's as much honey as she will store. And then she um, lays eggs and applies her abdomen to the hatched eggs as larvae in order to make the larvae uh, develop faster. She heats up her abdomen. And so she also is burning nectar um, for heat to heat up the larvae so that they will develop faster because the bumblebee uh, life cycle is kind of a race to get through the season in, um, in enough time to produce a good a good sized colony and then to produce males and females at the end of the season. So then um, after the first cohort of workers develops, then um, the workers take over and she becomes more like a queen honeybee. She stays in the nest. The workers do the foraging and also maintain the nest. And then um, they, the nest can develop to be the size of like 200 to 400 workers. And then at the end of the colony cycle, and we don't entirely know all of the, what's involved in, in sort of flipping the switch, but there's a switch that flips and the colony starts to produce males, which is something actually the queen can control. In Hymenoptera, males are from eggs that are not fertilized. And so the queen has like a, a supply of sperm and she can control whether each egg she lays is fertilized and will make a female or is not fertilized and will make a male. Anyway, so they produce males and then they produce queens. The males and the queens mate. And then everybody dies except for the mated queens. 
the mated queens then are the only ones that um, hibernate and survive the winter. And then the cycle goes on to the next year. So um, now we finally get to some talking about habitat. So how much flower rich habitat is enough for bumblebees? This is actually a study that was done in Europe. There are um, uh, subsidies that are given to farmers to plant pollinator habitat. And so this whole team of people in England studied um, how much habitat is needed and what kind of habitat is needed for bumblebees. And what they found is that bumblebees have several kinds of requirements and to be successful, they need all of them. So they need sources of nectar and they need those most critically early in the season when the queens are establishing their nests and incubating larvae. And then late in the season when the new queens are bulking up for the winter hi hibernation. They need nutritious pollen primarily um, through, through, through the summer. Pollen is the source of protein. I didn't really say that before, but that's kind of the distinguishing characteristic of almost all bees is that pollen is their source of protein. Some people say, um, and this is evolutionarily true, that bees are basically wasps that use protein as their source of food. Um, so it's just like a branch of wasps that developed just to, to, to use pollen as their source of protein. Anyway, so they need pollen as their source of protein and also fats and other kinds of minerals. They need nesting habitat. So I've talked a little bit about what kinds of nesting habitats they need. Some of them need to be nesting in forests while others nest in open meadows. So that differs amongst the species. They need a place to overwinter and we don't know enough about where they overwinter. And then they need protection from pesticides. So oftentimes people think of pollinator habitat as just being herbaceous perennial plants, but they do need um, sources of nectar and pollen through the whole season. So they need things like shrubs and trees that bloom in the spring uh, when the queen needs to be getting good sources of nectar, um, not just the um, perennial summer blooming things that we usually think of. So, and here are some of the early season plants uh, from a study that was done in Massachusetts. And as you'll see, they're mostly shrubs. So things like rhododendrons, pussy willows, dogwoods, um, holly, black cherry, winterberry, other kinds of willows. Um, so you get all the way down to beard tongue before you get something that is an herbaceous plant. Um, and, um, and several of these are things that are not used at all by honeybees. For example, rhododendrons are, are pretty much not used at all by honeybees. So, um, so different kinds of pollinators need different kinds of plants. So then the life cycle of solitary bees, as I mentioned, most species of bees are solitary. And unlike the social bees, the solitary bees have a short season of adult activity. So the solitary bees are, there are a few species, a few of the spring species that are just now starting to come out and be active. And so those first, usually it's first the males that come out and then the females, and they will be active for typically six to eight weeks. And each female makes her own nest. So this is um, this illustration is from a ground nesting solitary bee. So um, the the males and females mate. Um, the females um, feed on nectar in order to get energy. Actually, the males feed on nectar as well. Um, and then the females create a nest, in this case, by digging a tunnel in, in the ground and digging little cells off of the tunnel. In each cell, she puts a mass of pollen and nectar 
So that's that little ball you see in and sort of a little pocket in the ground. She lays an egg on that provision and then she closes off the cell. So there's no maternal care the way there is in honeybees and bumblebees uh, or some bumblebees anyway. Um, so then that egg hatches out, that larva feeds on the provisions. There's now a fair amount of research that shows that it's not just the pollen and nectar that the larva is feeding on, it's also the microorganisms that are developing on the pollen and nectar that provide the food for the larva. The larva develops to whatever stage is the overwintering stage. So in this illustration, it would be the pupa. And then it spends the rest of the year until time to emerge again in the nesting material. So in this case, it would be in the ground. So for this species, it would, it would spend, um, you know, there are 52 weeks in the year. It would spend about 46 or so of weeks of the year in the ground. Um, and so it's a very different life cycle from honeybees and from, you know, the social bumblebees as well. So um, Kalinis, um, this is, uh, they're called cellophane bees um, because in their ground nests, they, they line the nest with a material that is similar uh, to cellophane, sort of a clear material. Um, these are solitary bees, but they nest in aggregations. You can see, you know, several of the nests together in an aggregation. And, um, and but each nest is made by a single female. And um, these are, uh, uh, this is the time of year when people start to see, in particular, one of these early spring species, uh, Calides inequalis, um, uh, and they call the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and they say, I have bees in my yard. How do I get rid of them? Um, and um, we try to convince people that the bees in their yard are solitary bees. They're very different uh, from the bees that you think of as stinging you. They're very unlikely to sting you. I have done research on these bees. I have caught them in nets. I have dug up their, their nests, um, abused them in all sorts of ways, and I have never gotten stung by these bees. Um, so um, they are um, Calides inequalis in New Haven, they start to nest right around when the red maples bloom. And um, so I was looking for them this weekend. Um, I didn't see them in my yard this weekend, but they will be out this next week. So you should look for them and you should welcome them. You should, <laughs> they are, they're good pollinators and they're extremely cute bees, you can see. Um, so, um, and this actually, is from a picture from my yard. This is my Facebook profile picture, actually, um, of a Kalides nest with the little Kalides female up above it. So then uh, another whole group of solitary bees are um, the megachylid bees. Um, so they are different from uh, honeybees and bumblebees and in that they carry their uh, pollen on the underside of their abdomen. You can see this thick um, set of hairs under the underside of the abdomen. And you can see in the bee on the left, there's all that yellow on the underside. That's pollen that that bee is carrying. And um, so these are also important pollinators. Um, and some of them are leaf cutters and then others um, are cavity nesting bees that um, nest in tunnels. And um, here is a great picture that uh, somebody sent me of a leaf cutting bee. So the leaf cutting bees find um, uh, hollow spaces uh, to nest in and they uh, line their nest with pieces of leaf. So they go out and they cut little pieces of leaf with their mandibles and they bring the leaves back and they use the leaves as lining of the nest and to separate the cells of the nest. And then there are mason bees. And um, as I said, 
some people are familiar with mason bees because um, there are uh, people raise mason bees. So these are uh, pictures of somebody who raises them on a big scale and has, and so has sort of artificially provided uh, these straws for them to nest in. So um, artificial tunnels lined with paper, actually. Um, and then the bees themselves are called mason bees because they, um, they collect mud and they use mud to separate the cells um, of each individual um, uh, provision and egg and larva that will develop into an adult is in its own cell separated by mud. Um, and people get these bee hotels, but I am not a big fan of bee hotels. For one thing, a lot of them are just really poorly made. A lot of them um, are not long enough, um, are made of the wrong materials, are not made in such a way that they can be cleaned out. And so um, they uh, can become a focus of lots of problems. They, um, you can develop um, fungal pathogens that spread from one, uh, one uh, cell or tunnel to another. Um, or that remain in the tunnel year after year, infecting new bees. They can become a focus of parasites. Um, they can be a, become a focus of uh, predators like woodpeckers that like to um, find insect larvae and will take apart these bee hotels. So um, what I usually tell people is these bee hotels, first of all, you have to find ones that are that have the right dimensions, that are made the right way, and that you can clean out or else they become a focus of lots of problems. They're sort of like bird feeders. If you put bird feeders out and you don't pay any attention to them, they can become the focus of diseases and predators that are gonna feed on the birds. And the same thing is true of these bee hotels. Um, hang on just a second. I need to tell this person that I'm going to be here for a while. <laughs> so I am giving a talk. Um, I have not set the alarm. I, um, you can set the alarm if you want. Yeah, because I, I know how to turn it off. So just a reminder to everybody, um, if you have any questions, we'll hold, hold them till the end on yeah, a piece of paper, or you could type them into the chat now. I've already got yes. one question, yes. which will be at the end of the, uh, the program. And um, so I, I know that I've got two of my own I've jotted down on a piece of paper. So keep track of what you would like to ask Dr. Stoner. And we'll take questions right at the end. So I'm in my office and I had to tell the maintenance person that I will set the alarm when I go. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so some ground nesting bees. Um, so these I mentioned are, um, Ground nesting andrina bees, so they call they they're called minor bees or digger bees. We have 83 species in Connecticut. They are solitary bees, and some of them are plant specialists. Um, and um, so this is from apple trees. This is from a study of apple trees in New York. So it's a different study from the one I showed you before. And in this study, mining bees, so the genus Andrina, were just about half of the bees that visited the apple trees. And honeybees were a little more prominent than in the Virginia study. Um, but then, you know, there, um, there are also other slices of the pie. So the bumblebees, sweat bees, other um, apidae, the cellophane bees whom you have met and the mason bees whom you have met were all pollinating apples. And this is how much diversity there was in the Andrina, the genus Andrina, the mining bees. So that half of the bees that were visiting apples. So there were 31 different species of these ground nesting bees that were visiting and pollinating apples. So that gives you an idea of how much diversity there is even just looking at apple pollinators. So as I mentioned, some of the solitary bees can be specialists. And so one specialist that I've spent, spent a fair amount of time looking at are squash bees. So there is a genus, Eucera pruinosa, 
which uh, feeds its larvae only pollen from the genus Cucurbita, from pumpkins and squash. And so that's what it usually means in bees to be a specialist is that that, that means that they feed their larvae only pollen from a certain group of plants. So um, they could feed on other plants as sources of nectar, uh, but their larvae are dependent on a particular group of plants for their source of protein and fats to develop. So do native bees need native plants? Um, so the social bees typically are generalists because they have to feed their colonies over a long period of time. So they may prefer native plants, but they're adaptable. Um, and, um, and so I've looked quite a bit at sources of pollen for honeybees, for example. Um, and they, they use um, things like uh, clover, white clover and red clover, which are not native plants. They use those a lot. Um, they, they use a lot of um, other plants that are not necessarily native. Of course, honeybees are not native. But bumblebees also use clovers. They use um, a, a, a wide diversity of different plants. Um, solitary bees uh, have a short season of activity. And so, as we've mentioned several times, they may specialize on the pollen of a native genus or a few genera, or they might be generalists on a lot of different blooming plants during their season of activity. And it's not necessarily a black and white distinction. There are um, bees that are, they are, they use a few different genera, but they don't use like the whole range of different plants that are blooming during the time they're active. So these are some New England plant genera that have specialist bees. So um, goldenrod, goldenrod is just such a great plant. So um, goldenrod has 11 species of specialist bees. It's also a major source of nectar and pollen for honeybees, for a lot of bumblebees, for many different um, uh, types of bees. Um, the asters, so Symphiotrichum is like the, the more recent name for uh, the group of asters that includes New England asters and New York asters, and they have their own specialist bees. Um, uh, the yellow loosestrife, sunflowers, um, and, uh, and ground cherries, uh, so a lot of different herbaceous plants, but then also some shrubs like willows and uh, the genus Vaccin Vaccinium that includes blueberries and um, cranberries, a few other species. Um, so there's a whole range of plant genera with specialist bee species. Then um, the sweat bees. Um, these are very abundant, very common bees. There are lots, and lots of different species. They're very diverse. Some of them, as, uh, as I say here, are social. Some of them are solitary. Some of them are actually parasites on other species of sweat bees. Um, so lots of different kinds of little, little tiny sweat bees. And they're called sweat bees because they, um, some of them will land on you and drink a drop of your sweat, which we think is probably a way of getting some minerals. Um, then uh, there's, this is something that's really a hot topic of research right now is bees in trees. So for the most part, because it's hard to sample bees in the trees, we haven't known that much about what bees are up high in the trees. But this um, graduate student at Cornell has been sampling bees up in the canopy of trees and found that there are uh, just about the same number of species in the canopy as there are in the understory in forests. And there are some bees that are nesting. Um, Agachlora, which is a green sweat bee, um, was found mostly nesting up in dead wood in the tree canopy. Um, 
So, um, so this is like a hot topic that we're just finding out about it are all these bees that live sometimes their whole lives up in the trees. So as I mentioned, there are bees that are parasites on other bees. So, um, so all of the bees use pollen, all of our bees use pollen to feed their young larvae, but some bees don't collect any pollen themselves. They sneak into the nests of other bees and they lay their eggs on the provisions collected by the host bees. So um, this is, uh, so people call them cuckoo bees. So it's like uh, cuckoo birds that do the same kind of thing. Um, and um, this has evolved lots of different times. And oftentimes the parasites are attacking other pretty closely related bees. So there's a lot of interest in like, are they disguising themselves somehow um, so that they smell the same to the other bees? Um, and then there are whole genera that are all parasites on a particular group of bees, like the nomata are parasitic on the andrina. And then, um, so the larvae of these, par of these parasitic bees sometimes have to kill off the larvae of the host bees. So th this is a picture of some of these parasitic bee larvae that have um, pretty fearsome mandibles so that they can kill off the larvae of the, the other larvae that will be there um, and take over the provisions and um, feed on all of that and take advantage of their host bee. So now I'm gonna talk some about uh, pesticides. So in particular, I'm gonna talk mostly about insecticides. So it's hard to have insecticides that are gonna be broad spectrum killing a lot of pests and not kill bees because bees are insects and are physiologically very similar to other insects. Um, one of the uh, pesticides which has gotten a lot of attention recently is a group that are called neonicotinoids. And um, a large part of why neonicotinoids I think have become a problem is because they have been used so heavily and pretty indiscriminately. So um, they're used a lot as seed treatments. So there are various ways they can be used. And that's one reason why they're used so much is they can be applied to seed, they can be applied to soil, they can be applied to the bark of trees, they can be sprayed on, foli on foliage and then taken up by the plant. But it's really this seed treatment that is, has become so huge. Um, so you're looking at uh, a graph of how many millions of kilograms um, there are. Uh, so that's like half, half of that would be the number of millions of pounds. Um, how much is used in the US? Um, and so corn, and it's still true, this is from 2010, uh, but it's still true that nearly all the corn seed in the United States is treated with neonicotinoids. Something like two thirds of the soybean uh, seeds in the United States are treated with neonicotinoids. So, and these, these pesticides are very widely used because they are much more toxic to insects than they are to people, which is, an advantage, um, but uh, also means that they can be very heavily used without um, affecting people too much. Um, and so several studies have questioned whether there's any economic benefit to these millions of pounds of neonicotinoids that have been applied and whether they're having negative effects on the insect natural enemies that help to control insect pests. And now there are pests that are emerging that are resistant to them. And so this is a graph that shows like how much insecticide toxicity has been being applied by crop each year in the United States. So, and this is based on honeybee toxicity. So you can see that over the last 
um, well, going up to 2014. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good pesticide data after uh, about 2016 when people quit quit publishing pesticide data. Um, anyway, up to 2014, you can see how it grows and grows in terms of toxicity, total toxicity that's applied to different crops, especially corn and soybeans, but to some extent to other crops as well. And a very small amount of that pesticide actually ends up where it is intended um, in the crop controlling the pest when it's applied to seed um, or to soil for that matter. So um, a lot of it stays in the soil and soil water and it can, and these neonicotinoids are water soluble so they can leach into waterways. They can spread in the soil water to the adjacent plants, the field margin plants. And some of it actually drifts off as dust and that has affected bees as well. So um, people are starting to look at these soil nesting bees because as we've talked about, most bees nest in soil and looking at how much these neonicotinoids that are applied year after year to some crops and that remain mostly in the soil and that in some cases take over a year to break down as these accumulate in soil, how are they affecting the soil nesting bees? And this is a study that was done on squash bees. And actually, um, Susan Chan just published another paper looking at the effects of neonicotinoids on ground nesting bees. So um, overall, the important things to know are to minimize pesticide use. So this is basically integrated pest management, which um, uh, entomologists, plant pathologists um, have been preaching for decades. So use alternative methods of control if you can. If you need to use a pesticide, use the least amount needed and at the location where it will be the most effective. Um, and then Remember that bees and other pollinators are going to be on plants in bloom. So you don't want to apply pesticides, particularly insecticides, to bees when the, to plants when they're in bloom, when the bees will be there. And then work with beekeepers to protect honeybee hives. And then um, in Connecticut, homeowners can't apply these neonicotinoids, these, these particular neonicotinoids, which are restricted use pesticides because of their toxicity to bees and because of their other non-target effects. So what is pollinator habitat? We've talked about several of these things. So native trees and shrubs, native herbaceous perennials with enough diversity to have at least three species in flower through the growing season. If you're interested in moths and butterflies, you also need to pay attention to what they feed on, what plants they feed on. And then um, reducing insecticides, fungicides, and just using herbicides to manage um, problems, invasive plants and other und undesirable species. And then providing nesting habitat. So um, patches of bare ground, brush, dead wood, leaves, but really I say, you know, a diverse flowering plants with little or no pesticide use are, is, is better than lawn or pavement, which is, you know, mostly what we're substituting. Um, there are some situations, um, special situations to think about. So um, there have been some studies actually in Connecticut looking at, um, utility rights of way, which can be really good um, pollinator habitat uh, based on work that was done at Conn College in the 1950s and found that you could reduce the amount of herbicides that were used. So in the 1950s, they were just drenching everything with herbicides. They found that you could just target the herbicides to the trees that were gonna grow up tall enough to be in the power lines. And then you would get shrubs that were great for pollinators, that were great for birds, great for a lot of animals that need what we call early successional habitat. 
sort of low shrubby habitat. Um, and that that worked great. Unfortunately, and this is actually from Dave Wagner's study of rights of way, and you can see all this great habitat that's in there. Um, and you can see that they had roads to access it. But unfortunately, what's been happening is they've, the Eversource in particular has been um, taking out all of this pollinator habitat and paving the rights of way and um, creating lots of problems. Um, uh, creating problems with drainage as and and plant uh, rare plants as well as eliminating a lot of pollinator habitat. On the other hand, the Connecticut DOT has been really interested in reducing the amount of mowing and creating more pollinator habitat along the highways. Um, so. Um, they ha now have, I just heard a seminar by um, the folks at D D DOT who do this, and they now have about 80 sites where they have reduced the mowing, um, relatively few sites that where they've deliberately planted pollinator habitat, but they've found that they can survey the sites, find places that have native plants, and if they stop mowing uh, quite so much, then the plants come in on their own and they get good pollinator habitat. And that's what these pictures are of. So, um, and then there's also the pollinator pathway movement. Um, so in Canton, you have that as well as in really now most of the towns in Connecticut, um, a lot of Eastern New York State, some of Massachusetts, some of Pennsylvania. So this idea of creating corridors of pollinator habitat to connect up the natural areas in your town so that um, there are ways for the pollinators to move from one natural area to another and, um, and in general, just much more habitat for all kinds of pollinators. And of course, it benefits lots of other wildlife as well. Um, so this is my own yard. So as you can see, I have almost entirely eliminated the lawn and um, planted, not everything here is native, but a lot of it is native. And then I also grow vegetables and fruit and so forth for myself as well. Whoops. And then this is a great book, which I wish I had when I was designing my own yard about um, native plants for the small yard. So to actually like, pay attention to design and what it's all gonna look like and what will um, what kinds of plants will grow well together and will bloom over the course of the year. And this is actually, the link to this is on the Pollinator Pathway website and you can download the whole book. And then I, um, I mentioned just briefly nesting habitat. So, um, and, and also hibernating habitat. And this is something that um, I think is like the next step is to get people to leave the leaves on the ground. So once you get rid of the lawn, people remove leaves because it messes with their grass. But if you get rid of the grass, then you can leave the leaves. And, um, uh, and the leaves are important for um, bumblebee, overwintering habitat. They're also important for a lot of butterfly overwintering, um, firefly overwintering, a lot of insects. You know, this is what actually would be there in nature in the winter if we didn't take it away. So a lot of our native um, insects and wildlife benefit from leaving the leaves on the ground. These are, I'm just gonna give you some sources of information. This is the, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, which um, is, has fabulous, huge amount of information about all different kinds of pollinator habitat and pollinator conservation. They deal with other kinds of invertebrates as well, in addition to pollinators, but they have really taken on the whole pollinator thing in a big way. And um, this is uh, 
my website on the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station website, my page or my portal or whatever. So um, you can put what's at the top in and it will take you to this page. Or if you go to the Experiment Station website, you can put in pollinator in the search box and it will take you to the pollinator information page. And um, so the things you can do to help bees, I think we've been through all of these, reduce or eliminate the use of insecticides and fungicides, restrict herbicides to um, targeted applications to remove invasive plants and things and other kinds of really undesirable plants, plant a whole mix of things. So flowering trees, shrubs and perennials and to have nectar and pollen through the whole year. Native plants are best, but um, pollinators also use a lot of, of non-native plants. Eliminate your, as much of your lawn as you can. Leave natural areas for nesting and overwintering habitat. If you're a beekeeper, you have to manage mites and work with your community to preserve and create pollinator ha uh, habitat. And so this is my last slide with my contact information. And I will just leave that up and I'll answer some questions. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Well, thank you, Dr. Stoner. We do have some questions and I need to move my cat who's going to help me here. So I, I saw your cat moving around through there. <laughs> with all my meetings, which is very frustrating. And, 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 she's, she's a, and she's purring, you guys can't hear her, but she's purring. Um, Jenny Abel, would you like to ask your question or did it get answered? You were asking about, uh, about bees, funny thing. Jenny, are you there? Well, she had asked an interesting question. She asked before people harvested honey, um, what do the honeybees do with their excess honey and are we taking anything away from them? So um, we, uh, we are taking honey away from them. Um, uh, as I said, beekeepers try to calculate how much honey they're going to need to go through the winter. Um, but beekeepers also can supplement um, their energy supply with sugar, uh, sugar water or... Um, like uh, what they call uh, fondant, so like a sheet of of sh of sugar. So if they miscalculate, they can they can feed them some extra uh, sugar so that they can get through the winter. Um, so um, there are other animals that um, also will raid honeybee hives. In some cases, they're going after honey. Oftentimes, they're going after the bee larvae, actually, in the, in the uh, colony, because that's a source of protein. Um, but um, yeah, uh, if, if actually, if we don't remove the honey, um, honeybee colonies can be what the beekeepers call honey bound. So they have um, locked up so much of their, their comb with honey that they don't have enough room to expand. And, um, and at that point they would swarm um, because they don't have enough room for the colony to continue to grow. So they would leave some bees behind uh, with the um, new queen and then they, uh, a swarm would go off somewhere else and start over. Um, and so uh, that would be what would happen if we didn't take anything away from them. I see, all right. We've got a question from, um, from Jan. And uh, Jan, would you like to ask it yourself about the, the, the bumblebee queens? Jan Manchester? Yeah, I was just, do they, um... How many, how many new queens are formed or, you know, created, I guess, each season? Does anybody know? From a colony? Yeah. So it's very variable. Um, so people looking at bumblebee colonies, um, you know, it's sort of to measure the success of the bumblebee colony. Um, they, the bumblebee colony uh, typically... Um, 
would have to get to be a size, a good size of like 200 to 400 um, workers in order to be able to produce queens. And then, and they would, they would bring, we would produce males. Um, they're more likely to produce males if they're a small colony and they're not big enough really to produce queens. Um, uh, and so, um, but then uh, it's just hugely variable. Sometimes they okay. produce uh, just a handful of queens. Sometimes they'll produce 20 or 30 queens. It's, you know, they're just, it, there's a lot of variability um, and there's a lot of difference based on just sort of how successful the colony it, it is itself. Hmm. Okay. Teresa, you. would you like to ask your question about Mason Bee Hotels? Sure. Um, thanks, Dr. Stoner. Um, how do we clean out those Mason Bee Hotels? I, in the Master Gardener class I took, they, they, let, told us how to make them, but do we just throw the tubes away every year and start afresh? So um, it uh, it varies with how how you made them. Um, so how you can get access to them. So there are some kinds of Mason Bee hotels where um, they're like two parts put together with the tunnel in the middle and you can take them apart and clean them out. There are some that have paper tubes in them. So you can take the paper tubes out um, and um, let the bees emerge from the paper tubes and clean out the, the wooden tubes. Um, uh, and if you can't do either of those things, then probably what you would do is let the bees emerge and then throw it away and get something that you can clean out in the future. Um, yeah, yeah, it was just a, it was just an empty can and we put in the little wooden tubes. I mean, not the wooden, the cardboard tubes. Ah, so you, yeah. So you can let the bees emerge and then just get new cardboard tubes. And okay, put them there. Yeah. thanks. Yeah. So can I ask a follow up to that? How do you know the bees are out of it? Because these tubes are long. How do you know they're not still sleeping in there? So um, they come out the next year. So, um, right? So you, um, you uh, watch them the next year and you see, um, you see them come out and they would come out over a period of a few weeks. And, you know, if you're going to throw the tube away anyway, you can also... Uh, um, uh, open up the tube and see if everybody's out too. But yeah. Um, okay. Um, does that make sense to you? I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm picturing myself getting stung is what I'm picturing here. So <laughs> They're, They don't sting very much. Um, you know, that, that shed that I showed with the like hundreds, maybe thousands of... Um, of uh, mason bees in it. Um, a, a summer worker of mine went into that shed and uh, took those pictures. And she said, um, the problem that she had was that the bees kept trying to fly up her nose. Not that they were trying to sting her, but they were looking for tubes, tunnels to go into. <laughs> um, and um, so that was the problem. Now, I guess she would probably wear a mask and go in there. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so that, you know, these solitary bees, they don't sting very much. So Tatiana Ponder, you had a question. Would you like to ask that one? It's a great question. Hi. <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Dr. Stoner. I was surprised to know that a bumblebee lays a lot of eggs and she can choose which ones to fertilize in males and females. So my question is, does a bumblebee, does a bumblebee queen overwinter with a lot of sperm inside her to lay those legs, uh, those eggs? Yes, indeed. And uh, does she have to mate with a lot of different worker bees to collect so, that sperm? So in general, the bumblebees mate once. The bumblebee queens mate once. Uh, 
but yeah, so, and then she has um, a spermatheca. She has a, a, a pouch in which she keeps that sperm. And, um, and so she's overwintering with the sperm in there. Um, mostly what she's gonna be um, doing over the course. And so how successfully she mates also, you know, depends, you know, uh, determines partly how successful the colony is going to be because she's only going to be able to produce as many workers and queens, you know, females as she's got sperm to fertilize her eggs. Um, and um, so, uh, um, yeah, so she has a spermatheca and then she can control whether the sperm can leave the spermatheca or not. Um, Honeybees are like an entirely different story. Honeybees, uh, honeybee queens, um, I don't know if you're interested in this or not, but honeybee queens leave the nest only once when they fly out to mate. And they go to what the beekeepers call a drone congregating area where there's just like a whole bunch of male, that's drones or what we call the male honeybees. And they hang around and wait for a queen to come and they all try and mate with her. And so she, like, you know, the people studying honeybees say the more, most successful queens are the ones that mate the most times. Um, and each male honeybee, when he mates, um, the tip of his abdomen breaks off. So he dies after he mates. And, um, and then the queen comes back with all this sperm. And then she, you know, also has a spermatheca and can control whether she's laying eggs that are destined to be female or male, uh, depending on whether she fertilizes the eggs. So yeah, it's it's a weird system, but it's, that's how it it's is. It's quite amazing actually, but the a bumblebee queen has to, can mate only once? So typically that's, um, that's what the literature says is typically the bumblebee queens just mate once. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Jan Manchester, you have a question about uh, about herbicide, uh, pesticides. Yeah, I was at one talk about plants, and they said that, you know, we asked what to do about the red lily beetle, and he suggested putting like a systemic near the plant, you know, just as it was starting to poke out of the ground, and then by the time, he said by the time that it would bloom, it would it would have no effect on the bees or any pollinators. And I was just wondering if there was any truth to that. So I haven't, um, I haven't seen anybody study specifically lilies, but um, uh, a lot of people have looked at um, movement of systemic, uh, systemic insecticides in plants and in pollen and nectar. And um, for the most part, as the plant grows, the insecticide gets sort of diluted um, as the plant gets bigger. Um, and so um, there, uh, there, there are some situations where there are substantial amounts of systemic insecticides in the pollen in particular. And that's actually something I've studied quite a lot is looked at pollen and, and pesticides in pollen. Um, uh, it, um, it's not a simple situation. It depends a lot on um, the different plants. It appar apparently depends a lot on how the um, insecticide is applied. Actually, Rich Coles has also done some work um, looking at um, timing of pesticide application and how long it takes to move and different kinds of plants. And so there's lots of variables. So I would say that um, probably we really don't know. Um, and uh, the person who told you that was taking kind of a leap. Okay. Uh, Jenny Abel, um, your question about Eversource? 
Yes. Hi, Dr. Stoner. Hi, everyone. I wondered if there's some collective action we can take uh, to uh, convince Eversource that they should stop paving the right of ways. That's an excellent question, and I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, so um, there have been a whole series of, of groups of people who have tried to, um, mostly tried to just sort of convince Eversource not to do that. Um, so the Connecticut Botanical Society has been all over this issue from the beginning. Uh, from before I knew about it, actually. Um, and, um, and so they, um, they did a whole workshop. They did a whole forum with the um, Connecticut Land Conservation Council. I did a whole forum with um, here at the experiment station. Um, uh, and it just, it, and, and, you know, I, we've tried to tackle uh, the Connecticut Siting Council. So really what happened is the Connecticut Siting Council um, approved sort of a broad um, petition from Eversource to be able to do this in lots of different places. And then there are like little sub petitions that they do for each individual location. And my understanding, and I've asked lots of people at DEEP, and, and the petition does not allow them to do sort of this massive gravel kind of thing. It says actually that they're supposed to remediate everything when they get done. Um, and I've asked lots of people, who enforces this? If Eversource says to the Connecticut Siting Council, that they're gonna do something and they don't do it. And nobody seems to know the answer to that question. Um, there are groups, land trust, individual groups like land trusts that have made a big stink, um, hired lawyers, um, you know, and so Eversource and, and individual people have done the same kind of thing. And then Eversource cuts individual deals with the people who raise the most issues or get the best lawyers or whatever it is they do. Um, and um, so, you know, I know uh, people who like Dave Wagner, um, the Connecticut Botanical Society people, Ken Metzler, who have been like fighting this for years and just are so frustrated by the whole thing. Um, so I wish I could tell you something better, but I would say, you know, I don't know what the situation is with the Canton Land Trust, but um, if you, if they haven't come through and replaced their towers yet, you should stay right on top of them and make sure you mm. know. Um, uh, and, and make sure that when they send out their sub petition that you respond immediately and, and are prepared to document any uh, rare plants, um, rare animals, um, New England cottontail habitat, any kind of thing like that that you have that they are um, that they are really required to protect. And they mostly do protect like the rare, you know, if you bring to their attention rare species, they mostly do work around them. Okay. Um, Sylvia, question about ragweed? Yes. I used to have a wildflower meadow. It was lovely, but the ragweed took over, so I mowed it down. I'd quite like to send it back to a meadow uh, for the butterflies and the bees, but do they particularly like uh, ragweed? Because that's what's going to come back again. It just <laughs> takes over. Um, <laughs> is it worth it? So, um, so honeybees... You know, honeybees are such generalists that they do actually collect some <laughs> green pollen. <laughs> but, um, uh, and um, 
but uh, in general, uh, it's not great for for a diversity. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure, do you have ragweed or do you have mugwort? Um, oh, I thought it ragweed. I'm not quite sure the difference then. I'd have to look it up. Yeah, so... Um, I was often, told it was ragweed, but I don't really know. Oftentimes, um, what people have is actually mugwort, and it, mugwort is um, a perennial plant that's really difficult to kill. And um, oh, this <laughs> so um, uh, oftentimes... Uh, if you're, if, if, you know, people make an exception and use herbicides to kill all the mugwort before they try and plant the pollinator habitat. Um, it's, what, it's what's on the other side of my fence, so I know it'll all come back in again. Oh, yeah, 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 probably And will. I got rid of it because it sent it on my regular garden, which I didn't like. Um, if it was really worth it for the birds and the bees and the butterflies, I guess I could let it come back again, but none of it's not that, not that bothered about yeah, it. Yeah, it's not that great. So, um... I do know, so um, uh, in, a, in the um, at Edgerton Park, a park near here, they didn't want to use herbicides and they actually solarized it. They like put a clear tarp for a year down and solarized it, but it would, it would creep back from your edge. You could put a barrier in, you could put a... Um, uh, uh, so they're like, it's like edging um, that you would drive into the ground in order to keep the roots from, from spreading from your- I guess I thought it's for seeds, the, the wind, very windy up here. Yeah, and so, and they do, they do shed seed. Yeah, the mugwort yeah. shed seed. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I've used, the, I've used the edging to keep grass from creeping from my neighbor, yeah. but- um, but the mugwort would have seed as well as roots. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank sorry you to not give you not <laughs> give you a very positive answer to that question. Mugwort is really a huge problem and um, and very widespread to problem too. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So I've got two questions of my own. Um, do you talked a fair amount about wasps and yellow jackets? Are they pollinators or are they not pollinators? So, um, so yellow jackets are not really very good pollinators. They, um, uh, they do visit flowers mostly for nectar um, because their source of protein is um, other insects, mostly caterpillars. Yellow jackets like go out and, 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 uh, get caterpillars and bring them back and chew them up. And that's their protein source for their larvae. So um, uh, they, and they don't have a lot of hairs unlike bees. So there are wasps that are, are good pollinators. Um, as I said, there's a huge range of wasps. There are um, tens of thousands of species of wasps in in the US. Um, and so um, so there are wasps that are good pollinators, but the yellow jackets are not. Um, some people consider them beneficial in the sense that they um, are predators on caterpillars. So if you have caterpillars that are pests, people consider them beneficial in that way, but they're not really great pollinators. Okay. And, and then you um, earlier were talking about specialist bees, such as on goldenrod. When you, when, uh, is a specialist bee a bee that only goes to that kind of flower, or is it that the flower only has that kind of bee? So um, a specialist bee actually only uses that flower as a source of pollen for its larvae. So the specialist bee... Um, might visit other flowers for nectar, but uses uses that only that pollen for its larvae. Mm -hmm. um, the um, there are flowers that have um, only a certain pollinator 
for the most part, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So goldenrod is actually a great example. There are 11 species of bees that are specialists on goldenrod that feed their larvae only the pollen of goldenrod. But goldenrods, um, you know, it's a big group too, but goldenrods have um, enormous numbers of different pollinators. If you go and visit goldenrod, you know, when it's really in bloom on a nice sunny day, you'll see just a huge diversity of different insects. There was actually a great goldenrod project uh, where, um, which was a citizen science project where people went out and they took pictures um, and counted how many different kinds of insects they could find in their pictures on goldenrod flowers. So, so goldenrod is a generalist plant with lots and lots of different pollinators, but some of those pollinators are specialists. Good. Oh, thank you. I was I was wondering how, how that get defined. We got, I'm going to take. Oh, we got one more question, and I think we'll wrap up. Um, Jan Manchester um, just asked, "What are some of the best pollen flowers, and what what are some of the best nectar flowers?" So, could you leave us with the thoughts of maybe the three top ones that we should plant in our yard? So, um, so yeah. So, best. You know, there are lots like lots of different bees and lots of different <laughs> ways to decide what are the best. Um, so, um, but goldenrod is definitely a contender. Goldenrod, the, the um, common goldenrod, Canada goldenrod is an aggressive spreader. Um, so um, uh, you might wanna have other species of goldenrod that you plant in your yard, unless you want your yard to be all goldenrod. Um, but, um, but it, as I said, it's a tremendous plant for a huge uh, range of different pollinators. Um, so just three, three is very small. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, I would say um, willows, so like pussy willows in the spring. So you, if you're only going to have three, you want to cover all the seasons. So pussy willows are really good in the spring. And then they also have specialists and a lot of generalists as well. And even honeybees use pussy willows too. Um, all right. And then one, one plant for the middle of the season. <laughs> um, you know, um, a good one is mountain mint. There are a couple of different species of mountain mint, but mountain mint um, is uh, also just uh, has a huge range of different pollinators. It is also a pretty aggressive spreader too. Um, I have mountain mint in my yard, but I have it in the little space between the sidewalk and the street and my neighbor's driveway. So it's in one little, one little corner so that it could only spread in one direction. Um, but, um, but that's really a pretty amazing plant in terms of pollinator visitation too. Well, Dr. Stoner, I wanna thank you so much for joining us this evening. This was a fascinating talk and uh, I, uh, speaking for everybody, I think everybody really enjoyed this. Um, Teresa Barger just added one last note here. She goes, the National Wildlife Foundation has a native plant guide where you can type in your zip code. It'll give you trees and shrubs and perennials and tell you how many pollinators use it as a food source. So um, that's that's a good little thing to know. So National Wildlife Federation. And uh, Dr. Stoner, you got the last word. Anything you'd like to say to everybody before we, uh, we sign off here? Um. Uh, I guess I would just say, you know, there's a huge amount of information out there. So, um, so you know, I've selected some of it and put it in my page. The Xerxes Society has a huge amount of it. Um, I, I haven't looked that much at the National Wildlife Federation. I know um, the Audubon Society also has um, some uh, a native plant plant. Uh, uh, website as well where you can put in in information about where you live and it will give you plants there's 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 so much information out there um and um so you know uh get rid of your lawn and plant some plants <laughs> And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining the Canton Land Trust this evening, and I wish you well. 
and I'm going to sign us off. So okay, thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.